Good morning, everyone. May God bless you and keep you on this beautiful April 25th, April 25th, 2021. Uh, we want to thank God for allowing him to, to allow us to come together as men and women, men and women of Christ once again. Or you know that uh, we're, now we're getting ready to go into the month of May. I mean, it's a very exciting time that we're able to go into another month. Things are just moving so quickly, so quickly, so quickly. But we're going to get back into the book of Colossians, book of Colossians and this church of Colossae, thinking about Paul, Paul's mission, Paul's letter to Colossae. And as we've stated uh, in, in the past weeks is that Paul has not visited Colossae. He probably did not visit uh, Laodicea as well. But we do know that he wrote letters while in bonds, while he was in Rome to the church of Colossae, mainly because of the task, mainly because of, of what Epaphras had stated to him, that this church is really trying to do what is right in the name of Jesus Christ. They are trying to establish churches and, and, and trying to abide by the laws and the rules of what Jesus Christ has told them to do, which is just pretty much to love one another, love one another, Donnell, just love one another. That is the law now. No longer are we under the laws, uh, Mosaic laws or the laws of Abraham, that if you truly just love and trust one another, that is enough. That is what God has required. So that is the reason for this letter to Colossae. Uh, we do know that, that as we stated, that, that Paul is nearing his death. He is writing this letter uh, from Rome. And we do know that he knows that the time of his departure is at hand. It is coming soon. But despite all of that, he is willing and he is faithful and he is just in knowing that his reward is awaiting for him, which is in heaven, as long as he continues to do the will of God. And that's what he is doing in this, in this letter to Colossae. Very exciting letter, right? Uh, but let's get into this. Let's uh, um, uh, get into the Lord of Prayer first. Let's say a prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us to wake up and see another day today. For it's only because of your grace and mercy that we are able to stand. We thank you for a reasonable portion of good health and strength. We thank you for food. We thank you for clothing. We thank you for uh, mental health, Lord. We thank you for allowing all of our travels. Uh, if we have traveled anywhere uh, outside of our house, that you are able to allow us to leave our homes and come back again safely. So we thank you for our children and our, our nieces, our nephews, our uncles and, and grandparents, many of you that have grandparents. So we thank you, Lord, for, for allowing all of us, Lord Jesus, to be in your presence today, right? To be able to acknowledge the fact that you are the creator of the entire universe. And it's because of this church at Colossae today that we truly understand why this was so necessary for the church to understand who Jesus Christ was and his mission and purpose while on earth. So we thank you, Lord, for, for allowing us once again to be in your presence today. And I pray that a message will fall from heavens and not from me. And I pray that I may be able to obtain something from this, being a servant of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this message will reach someone that they may go out and tell a dying world about who Jesus Christ is. So bless us and keep us on this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation and fear of the Lord in his treasure. Isaiah 33 and 6. And here's our passage of scripture today, Kent. We're coming from um, Colossians 2, uh, verses 1 through 6. Once again, Colossians 2, 1 through 6. And it reads, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, right? that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom all are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye had therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Colossians 2, 1 through 6. There's a story, um, uh, a movie a while back that I, I, I saw back in 2001, actually, I can't believe it's been this many years, over 20 years ago. Many probably know this movie, by, uh, and Heath Ledger was in it, the late Heath, Le uh, Heath Ledger. And I know that uh, Donnell probably knows we've talked about this movie before because there's a lot of biblical text that comes out of this movie. But the name of the movie is called The Knight's Tale. And it's a Canterbury tale. And as I stated, it was written in, this movie was made in 2001, right? 
And it's an American medieval adventure romance comedy film, right? And it was written and produced by Brian Helgelin. And as I stated, uh, Heath Ledger, uh, Shannon Sossaman, Mark Addy, and many other well-known actors are in this movie, okay? The title of this message today, as I back up, right, is Follow Your Feet. Follow Your Feet. We're going to find that in Colossians 2, 1 through 6. Follow Your Feet. So as I move forward, the story is told in an anachronist style with many modern references. It follows a peasant named William who poses as a, as a knight and he competes in these tournaments, right? Winning accolades and acquiring friendships with such historical fig figures as Edward the Black Prince, right? And Jeffrey, Ch uh, Je uh, Jeffrey Chaucer. This movie is one of my favorites, right? For it talks about how we as believers must rely on our talents and faith in difficult circumstances, right? That when we choose to be like someone else, our fate catches up with us. We must be ourselves. It is important to be yourself and not portray to be something that you are not. If you lose your coach, your teacher, your mother, your father, your grandparents, or someone who is of great importance to you, how we get back up, how do we keep moving as, as we go through those losses is essential to living your life as a Christian today. But change not, be you. Isn't this the carpenter's son, right? Be you, be you. Are not his brothers and sisters with us today? They're out there waiting, Jesus, right? All those that believe in me are my brothers and sisters, Jesus replies. All right. So this is about as, as rudimentary as one can get, right? Jesus pretty much telling everyone that everyone is my brothers and sisters to all those who believe in me. So we have one uh, in the Son of God, yet proclaiming that I live in the neighborhoods and the communities from Jerusalem to the Decapolis, from Sidon to Egypt, from Rome, all parts in between. All that believe in me are my brothers and sisters. I am not trying to be something I am not, but I'm trying to be everything to everybody. Amen. There's a moment in the movie, as I digress, when young William is given over to a knight by his father. Young William is around 12 or 13 years old at this time. We don't know um, if his mother has passed. We do see in the movie where his father uh, takes a, a, a small boat. He rolls across this river or this lake hands his son, young William, over to uh, this knight. Looks like he's a very rich man, right? And he hands him over to this man because he wants to be a knight and maybe because young William's father cannot afford to keep him anymore. He wants him to be a man. His father is elderly. He is unable to care for him. So he allows him to go off and be trained and given responsibility over to someone who can intern him, right? Uh, to be, so the boy can shadow, young William can shadow and be an apprentice as he is taught the ropes of becoming a knight. So what happens at young William's handover is that he asks his father, get this, Father, when I am afraid, how will I get back home? In which his father replies, don't be foolish, William. Just follow your feet. C.S. Lewis goes further in saying, in mere Christianity, he argued for the existence of an instinctive, God-given, natural law or universal morality. He claimed that people everywhere know this law and know when they break it. So even believers and non-believers alike, there is something in your conscience that goes all the way back to the book of Acts, the second chapter. There's something in your conscience that tells you whether you go to church, whether you've never been to church, there's something that tells you or reminds you that, wait a minute, I did something wrong. He says there is something in the existence of us, God-given natural law or universal morality. He claimed that people everywhere know this law and know when they break it. There must be someone or something behind these universal principles, C.S. Lewis goes on, that oversimplified proves the existence of God. So you have many people who are atheists, many people who claim not to be believers in God, not to be believers in the, in the, in the, in the deity, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Choose not to believe in these things, but there is something in their conscience that tells them when they have done something wrong or when they're about to do something wrong. God has given everyone the opportunity, believers and non-believers, atheists, Gnostics, you can go on down the list, right, that... Whatever you're doing is absolutely wrong and that you know that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and everyone's going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord in the end. 
there is something in their conscience that tells them that they are doing something wrong. Hmm. So I'd like to pose a question to this church today or a thought. Is it possible that all of us know the way home? Whoo. But we have chosen to forget about the path that we know will take us there. Amen. Have we forgotten, right? We, we know God has given us the path to make it home. But have we forgotten about the path to get there? Amen, Tracy Menace. We know the path to get home. Have we forgotten or just neglected how we get there? We see this today with many, many evangelicals, right? And we have to pray for all evangelicals that they get back to Christianity 101, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that every man, right? Uh, uh, men, women, children, black, white, doesn't matter. Asia, uh, uh, Africa, Australia, doesn't matter. That every man has a right to believe in this, this, this Christian, this, this Christianity, that this Jesus Christ came and rose again on the third day, that he died for all sins, that he shed blood for everyone, that we may all have a right to the tree of life. Christianity 101, that's what this is all about. And that's what, that's what Paul is trying to tell the church at Colossae today, that just Jesus Christ, even though you are a Greek, even though you're a Gentile, even though you've never been to Jerusalem, made your pilgrimage to Jerusalem, that Jesus Christ has chosen you uniquely. And as I stated two weeks ago, that you are now saints, that I already see you, already see you in heaven in a white robe. So as believers in Jesus Christ, we already know the way home. Many of us already know the way home, even though we neglect, even though we fail to go to church, even though we fail to pray for other people, there is something that reminds us, whether we're CMEs or what, that, you know what, I should, it is Mother's Day. I need to be in a church. No, 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 I won't go to church today. Christmas time. Oh, I, about the, the baby. Oh, oh, no. Easter, a few weeks ago. Oh, he died on the cross. And he, okay, yeah. There is something within us that tells us that that is the right thing to do, and we choose not to follow that path. But glory be to God in the book of Colossians, right, and, 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 and to the church of Colossae, that Paul is illustrating, that he is demonstrating that there is something more important than your belief system, whether you know about the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, or anything, as I stated a few weeks ago, it does not matter. That because of your belief, your centralized belief, because of that you're trying to understand who Jesus Christ is, that you're trying to establish a relationship with him, that you're trying to break away from idolatry, that you're trying to break away from all these things going on around you that are inherently wrong, that Jesus Christ has chosen you because you're now hearing and seeing his word that you are now saints in heaven. Hmm. So as believers in Jesus Christ, as chosen children of God, we ask the same questions each and every day, don't we? Right. Or we ask when we are in times of trouble and in certain events in our life where we see no pathway, no light, no end, no way out. Right. We turn in our prayers and in the doubts of our minds and we ask God, yes, it is true. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. You also said that where your heart is there, I would be also. And in the times of trouble and heartache, you would be a shelter and a protector. So we ask God, how do I find my way home? Paul tells us in the book of Philippians 1, 21 and 25, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet well shall I choose, I would not. For I am in a strait, I am betwixt, I am conflicted between one or the other, a, a desire to depart and be in heaven and to be with Christ, which is far, far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Meaning, I would rather, 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 rather be in heaven, right? But if it be God's will, I will stand here and stay here and continue to plant these churches along the way. So even though heaven is far, far better, I will continue to do the will of God and plant these churches and hope that hundreds of thousands of millions of people in 2021 will come to the full knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Amen. I am conflicted. I am betwixt. I am conflicted between, uh, between going up there and staying down here. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And in verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you and for your furtherance and joy of faith. 
meaning I'm going to be there with you, even through your trials and tribulations of your life. Even though I am the last person on the earth to have seen Jesus Christ and heard his voice, and you haven't seen him, I want you to rely on your faith, Church of Colossae, common ground. I want you to rely on your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and because you are preaching and teaching the Word of God, that it is coming from Not coming from your mouth. It's coming from your mouth, but it's coming from heaven above. The only way that I can proclaim, the only reason that any of us can can, can go onto our phones today and rejoice and praise God, even though we are sleepy, we're drinking coffee, we haven't taken a shower yet, but something has told us to listen to the word of God today that we may be able to move forward in the next six or seven days with a renewed strength and renewed faith. And as I digress... There's a passage in the scripture uh, where it talks about that our faith is being renewed day by day. And what that truly means, what it means is that, get this, and I want everyone to shout because this is exciting. What that passage of scripture means, as I've done research on it, is that as we grow older in the faith, that we are getting closer, we are learning more, that that we're moving further and further away from this earthly body, right? into a heavenly temple, that we are moving away from, right, our mortality and moving into immortality, even though we don't see it, that we are actually getting stronger in the faith, that our bodies and our minds and our souls and our spirits are actually moving towards salvation, even in the flesh, even as we are learning and moving through what we're, through this New Testament uh, passage of scripture today. And whatever is going to happen in 12 months or in the next 15 years, that as you continue to 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 moan and groan in the faith in your tribulations, that you're actually getting closer and moving closer to your salvation, that not all of this is in vain. That I am stronger, Kent and Tracy, that I am stronger than I was last Sunday. I'm much stronger than I was 12 months ago or, or half a year ago when COVID hit when we started doing this, these messages, right? Or when I was seven years old and was baptized at Second Baptist in Pratt, Kansas. I am much stronger. I am moving closer and closer, even though I don't run my 5Ks and half marathons as fast as I used to, right? That my mind, my body, my spirit is moving closer and closer to the spiritual knowledge of Jesus Christ. That I am moving closer, that I'm beginning to look more and more like him. If I'm, if, if I'm in my 80s, like Larry and Travis, it doesn't matter. They are moving closer and closer into perfection in the name of Jesus Christ. Even though we're seeing it in the flesh, even though we cannot comprehend what is going on in the physical body, and we know that these bodies are being broken down, whether we're in our 50s or in our 80s, we do know that God is strengthening them. Even though they're losing a step, right? even though they don't remember things the way they used to, that God is moving them towards something we just cannot understand or ascertain, but it is much, much better, far better as Paul states. If I remain here, fine, right, for the glory of God, because our elders are still blessing us in our presence, even though we pray for them and, and we are moaning and, and our trials and tribulations, we are moaning because we see them not, they're, they're much different men and women that we used to grow up with, right? They're, they're much slower. We got to pay attention to them more, listen to them more, right? But do know that they are great, that they are getting stronger in the faith. So in Colossians 2 today, we learn that wisdom and knowledge as we stated two weeks ago, has already been given to us by God, through Christ, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So how do we accept this gift? How do we know when we have received it? Well, simply, how do you entrust in God and how do you love your neighbor and how do you love yourself? That is the true testament. That is the true barrier. That is the true measurement of how we know that we have overcome, that, we, that the Holy Spirit lives within us. As I stated before, what has happened, what has transpired is the fact that we already know, believers and non-believers alike, right? That there's something going on with me that I should be paying attention to, and it is the Holy Spirit. So if you've answered yes to any of those questions I just asked, right? 
You have the Holy Spirit in you. It has been revealed and given to you since creation. And you have been uniquely chosen to receive it, to act on it, and to share this good news to those who have not allowed the Spirit to dwell in them and to be an instrument of righteousness in your life. So here we go. Finding our way home is not difficult. It's all about trusting in God to the church of Colossae. It's about being beholden to the Holy Spirit at all times and all things. Notice Paul is not mentioning anything about the Holy Spirit to the church of Colossae. I, I, God is already in you. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the deity is already in you. You're already being accepted. You are already a saint in heaven because of your belief. You have chosen with your mouth to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So immediately you are accepted into the grace of God. So finding your way home is about remembering what was given and what was taught to you in all righteousness. In other words, finding what is good in you from the start and relying on those tools and those gifts sent from above to guide your feet. Have you ever noticed like when you, whenever you're out in public, you, you wonder why at a certain moment, a certain uh, 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 event in time where you, you find yourself opening the door for someone. I know I'm beating this to death, All right? Or you're, you're, you're waving someone, waving a, a car or whatever through traffic, right? You're like, no, 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 you go, 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 right? This is all about love. It's about uh, giving of oneself. It's about compassion. It's about empathy, right? Helping a young child up after they fall down, you know, in the street. And even though they're not crying, or if they are crying, you're helping them out. You're saying, hey, it's going to be okay. That's the God we serve. So as we tackle this verse 1, let us always keep in mind that when we speak about the churches that Paul planted or had a hand in establishing these biblical policies, we oftentimes focus on the church. We never consider multiple churches. And I should have emphasized this two weeks ago. When we speak of the church of Colossae, it doesn't mean... A sing, the singularity of the church at Colossae. There's a multitude of churches in Colossae. There might have been 5, 10, 15. They, what they're called in the Greek, ekklesia. Ekklesia meaning church or to be set apart from the rest of the world. You are set apart in this message today. You could be someplace else right now, but you cho chose to be part of the body of Jesus Christ as millions and even billions of people are doing on this Sunday morning to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. So the church at Colossae is, is it's, it's plural. It's not singular. It's, it's many churches of five and 10 and 15, maybe a hundred people. And what Paul is trying to illustrate through Epaphras is that I want all these churches to come into the full knowledge as one, right? And, and have one major policy, which is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do not worship these dumb idols, right? And know that you, when you come into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, you'll know it through love. Hmm. So just given a background into verse 1, right? And I, we could spend some time in this, right? It says that, you know, as, as we reflect upon the words of Apostle Paul or focus quickly, right? Points uh, once again towards, uh, you know, uh, for, verse one is pointing towards Laodicea once again. Paul is making mention again of Laodicea. And I brought this up on last week. So in Revelation three, it speaks of this. And then to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Let me back up. As we know, Laodicea is within 40 or 50 miles of Colossae. But we find them together because why? Because they are doing the same thing. They are having this struggle. Let me read on. I know thy works that thou are neither hot nor cold. I'd rather have you cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spoo thee out of thy mouth. Let me read further. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So theoretically, this is what Paul sees in the church of Colossae as he does in the Laodosians, right? He sees a church that is very rich, as I stated a few weeks ago, that uh, the uh, cotton goods and, and silver, right? That the, even, the Gentiles and the Jews, everyone is rich. Everyone is upper middle class in these communities, these two communities. He sees a church that is very rich and they have no need of nothing. But in reality, Paul is stating, you are poor in your spirit. Now you have all the physical, you have all the earthly goods, 
But because you're having this conversation, right, that you are conflicted between Diana and Zeus and, and serving Christ all at the same time, let me tell you, you are poor in spirit. You are blind in the spirit, blind in the invisible spiritual world, not lacking in the physical. You are not lacking in the physical. You have food, water, you have servants, you have fresh clothing to put on. You are wealthy above all, right? But in the invisible world that we will all partake in, in the end, you are blind and naked. Clearly, Paul is talking about Christ when he refers to this fine gold, something that has already has always been of great value. God, God has discovered something in us that's much more valuable than gold, which was very intrinsic at that time. As we look at oil today, oh, we need oil. We need oil. Well, gold was the oil of the day. So that is why he is making reference to this today, Larry. Our value is great. So that so that Christ, the son of God, died for us. And ever since then, the devil has set out to destroy us. Why? Because of our great value to Jesus Christ. He wants to destroy us because of these vain babblings and our finances and relationships, all these things that distract us, drugs and self-doubt, mental health, all forms of, of unrighteousness or the attack or these attacks coming from the devil. But our God is above all and in all. He is majestic. He is the supreme. Let me shout. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the root of Jesse, the offspring of David. Talking about Jesus. He is the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the bright and morning star. This is Paul's reference. This is what Paul is trying to tell them. I don't want you to be concerned about these material things in your life. I want you to be concerned about your spiritual, about your soul. What happens when you die? When you die, where does your soul go to? And you will find peace, right? You will find what you're looking for if you trust in this God through Jesus Christ. So if God has created all of this for us to enjoy on earth and in earth, Namely, those things that we can see because we spoke about Christ being the creator of all things, mm -hmm. invisible and visible. So what would, we make, what would make you think that he is uh, not rooting for us for our earthly survival into his heavenly realm? He is fighting wanting us to get this, get this. Just love, just love. You don't have to understand everything. I just want you to love your brother as much as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as much as yourself. Your neighbor, uh, your next door neighbor, everyone on the other side of the planet, all, on the other side of the globe, in other countries. I just want you to love. That's all I want you to do. And in, do, and in doing so, you will find yourself in moving from this visible world that we can see and partake of, and you'll find peace once you reach the invisible, when you close your eyes, when you fold up your tent for the very last time. Hmm. So if everything we see was made good, I cannot imagine what the invisible looks like. Ooh, what does the invisible look like? Because I stated in Colossae, he said, I made all things invisible and everything that you can see. I made I created all these things. But there is a, there's another realm out there that you have not seen that I have created. That's far better, as Paul stated, it's far, far better, far, far better than this. So the Rocky Mountains, oh, though beautiful. <laughs> the Appalachians, oh, so beautiful. Mount Kilimanjaro, oh, so beautiful. The Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean, oh, it's so beautiful. The Caribbean, oh, the water is so majestic, it's so blue. I got to get there. There's something much bigger on the other side waiting for us that we cannot even imagine. Verses two through four speaks on the matters of the heart, that this relationship is built upon something that originated from the Godhead from the beginning, and it is built on love. Many of us know if we've been fishing, like Larry Menace and, and, and Kent and, and Donnell and everyone that's found his call, the Menaces and everyone that's found his if you've been fishing, oftentimes when, they, when we'd bump into these snakes, right, or we'd hate to bump into a snake, we knew that, hey, if we bump into a snake, we're going to cut off the head. If you cut off the head of anything, it's not going to survive. Hmm. Verses 2 through 4, as I say, it originates from the Godhead from the beginning and is built on love. God is the head. It is the love that first John speaks of. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is 
love. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Amen. All that is wrapped up in the mystery of God is in the quiver of your own heart. We all have this quiver and it's full of these love darts, right? These love arrows. It is an arsenal that you have already obtained and it resides, get this, in you. And it is up to us and you to see these arrows as, as, as competence, right? To accomplish the task of converting a dying world, those who are dying because they don't know a Jesus Christ, into the direction from the visible into the invisible. That's what Colossians 2 is all about. It's about, it, it's about telling the, the church of Colossae that there's something immediately on the other side, that when you, as I stated, fold up your tent for the last time, as Paul referenced. And what we, what we must realize when we think about the writings of Paul, this first century apostle, right? When we think about what he is writing about, just think if he would have been a scientist or a doctor today, he'd have been talking about molecules, okay? He'd have been talking about something that he could really, that we could really grab hold of and say, oh, I understand this. But I like the analogies that he's, that he's given. We know that he was a tent maker. So if he's a tent maker, his analogy is that when we fold up our tent for the last time, that means when we, when we, when we pack up, when we move on to another place, because we will not be here forever. When we close our eyes, we move on, we pack up our tent, amen, and we go to another place. Don't laugh at me, Kent. Creedence Clearwater Revival says that someone told me long ago there is calm before the storm. I know it's been coming for some time. They go on to say, I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? I want to know, have you ever seen rain coming down on a sunny day? I know, shining down like water. <laughs> The passages in Revelation also points to the character of the church of Colossae and its neighbors, the Laodosians, that they are people of great wealth. They are prideful. They believe that all they have gained, all that they achieved in life was through their own efforts. No, God through Paul is telling them like he is telling us today that we are naked and blind without Christ. I cannot emphasize that enough. We are simply clothed and covered in unrighteousness and appear to have altogether we appear to have it all together, but the true reality is that we are not ourselves, that we have been bought with a price, the, pre the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We have, been, we have been bought, right, by God himself. God came in the flesh, gave up himself in the flesh, dwelt among us in the flesh, died, bled in the flesh for us. We have been bought with a price. This is not a plaything. What, what was demonstrated on the cross should be enough. Even if we don't know Jesus, the fact that someone making a proclamation that you are no good, that you are counted as sheep before the slaughter should bring us joy. That in Romans 5 and 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? Yet meaning up, up until the present or uh, to a specified or, or, or implied time by now or then or at the same time but nevertheless talking about yet what does yet meaning in that while we are yet sinners Christ died for us let me back up again yet what does yet mean right Miriam Webster goes on to say that yet means besides or nevertheless okay no less in due time okay while we are still becoming, while we are still moving forward, while we are still sinning each and every moment of the day, while we are still doing these unrighteous things, while we are still being born, still being shaped, as David stated, in iniquity, that those bills have been covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As I begin to close, Psalm 8 states that, uh, what is man that, that, you are, that you are so mindful of him and the son of man that you would even come and visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. And 1 Peter 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perish, perishes, though it be tested with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Talking about our value, y'all. This is what Paul is trying to get across to the Colossians, that you are much valuable than you can ever imagine in the sight of God. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what your future looks like. 
Even though you are still a sinner, the fact that you have accepted him and that you are moving further and further away from your sinful life, even though you're not perfected today, that you're not perfect today, that you're not perfect five years from now, that you're not perfect 15 years from now, that I still love you and I died for you. Paul's making known to those who, who he has never met before that, that the only true way to Christ is through is by by love. Yes, that all churches need to be knitted together, but but through it all, the solidarity, their sustainability, their oneness can only be found in Christ, through Christ, Christ all in all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Paul is emphasizing that I don't I, I don't have to be present in order to illustrate the love of God, to teach you the love of God, the secret of Christ. I don't have to be there to tell you, but I'm gonna write about it in this letter. So I want you to tap into this wisdom and this knowledge that Christ has already provided for you, that he's already placed upon your head. You will discover him through this succinct gathering of the church of Colossae. There must be a mutual solidarity and understanding in the mission of the church, that the church is responsible for preaching and teaching Christ to those who believe non-believers alike. And as I close, who preaching to myself today, because I need to get this. I need to understand this. I need to be a re reassured as a minister of Jesus Christ. Then I need to find that same excitement, that same energy, that, that same compassion, that same empathy, that same reason to get up each and every day to proclaim that Christ is the son of the living God and that he died for us and that he sent his Holy Spirit and, and it rested upon, upon who? All men, upon all flesh. So this is Paul telling the church of Colossae, you already got it. You already have it. You already have it. Hmm. Much more being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him, that there's some stuff going on in our conscience, that there's these battles going on, that Satan is trying to take us down because we were made in the image of our God. So Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses, talking about Hebrews. Jesus is greater than Joshua. Jesus is greater than the priest of Aaron. But not only is Jesus better than any other human religious figure, he is also a better minister after ushering in a better covenant built on better promises with a better sacrifice. That's what Jesus did for us. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless on this morning before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You may not think, I cannot emphasize this enough, but giving this benediction means much, much more than what I just preached about just now. That now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, without error, so if you were to fold up your tent right now, you would be presented in front of God as perfect, like Jesus is. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That means that, that Jesus Christ will stand there and say, this is Philip Finley. He is made in my image. I died for him and I welcome him into the kingdom of heaven. Though he was, you know, he, he was faithful over a few things, now I'm going to make him a ruler over many things. Do I deserve this? Yes, Philip, you deserve this. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today for the book of Colossians. Uh, the second chapter of the letter that, that, that Paul wrote as an instrument, as a guide for the churches of Colossae, that they should not be uh, split apart and broken apart, uh, that they should come together with a mutual understanding that Jesus Christ is 
the one who solidifies and brings all churches together into one body, that they should not be separated in their belief central uh, belief systems, that they should come together as a centralized belief system and be able to tell others in a dying world at that time that Jesus Christ, this one from Jerusalem that you heard about 60 years ago, died, rose again on the third day and lives again. So we thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us yet again today. You have been so good to us. I cannot even imagine. Lord, watch over us and keep us today as we move through perilous times, as we uh, see and hear things that don't make sense to us, but we do know that you're in control of all these things. We do know that as the, as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, that you are there. We do know that as snow is falling in the northeast or up in the north and, and, and people are sitting on the beach and swimming in the south, that you have control over all these things, that, uh, that, that how, you, how you took the stars in, your, in one hand and just and flung them out into the universe for our benefit, for, your, for, for the beauty of the world. We thank you, Lord, for the flowers and the trees and the birds that sing each and every morning. We thank you because you are a loving God. And we look forward to that day when we fold up our own tent and go and be with you, Lord. For we know, Lord Jesus, that I, that I would rather be here starting churches and preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is better. But I know that there's something far, far, far better, which means that I would rather be with you, Jesus. So bless us and keep us on this day. Keep us safe. And I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So if anyone doesn't know Jesus Christ as pardon of their sins, that if they just confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ uh, lived and died on the cross and was rose, rose again on the third day, as to the church of Colossae, you shall be saved. It's as simple as that. That God will continue to work and manifest his, his hopes and dreams, his, his faith, his, his reason, his purpose, his love, his compassion in you. And you will, as I stated, continue to grow in the faith, right? So as this earthly body continues to shut down, do know that you're getting stronger in Christ, that you're gaining momentum for kingdom worship. Amen. So be safe. I love everyone. Next week we'll be having communion. I can't believe it's the month of May. So thank you, everyone. I love you. Take care. God bless you.